Marks is here with us again this morning. He did a wonderful job last Sunday, and as I said, I've heard him preach even before last Sunday. I always enjoy his sermons. I'm very excited to hear him preach again. But as he'll say, it's not about him, it's about Christ. And that's another mm -hmm. thing that I, uh, uh, that I very much admire about him. He's a very humble person, which I feel is one of the uh, hardest Christian traits to master. And I feel like he has a great humility, and I feel like he's a great, very great preacher, and we're very excited to hear him. So, Brother Marx, please come forward. Thank you, Brother Garrison. Again, uh, thank you for your kind words, but it's about Christ and not about me. Um, if you have your Bibles today, though, I'd, I'd like to ask that you would open up to where we will be in the, the Word of God today, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. The, uh, the title of my message is, Does Creation Matter? And this is the second time I've, I've preached this message, preached it a few years ago when I was finishing up seminary, um, because it, it's so important to the very beginning of the Scripture. Do we believe it? Do we believe what God said? It, it tells a lot about how we look at the rest of Scripture. And you know, we, we're gathered today here on Sunday to worship the Lord. It's about Him that we're here. We're not here because of who's speaking or just because it's cool, even though it's nice there's some air conditioning Amen. this week. But uh, we're gathered to worship Jesus. And we gather on Sunday because He rose from the grave on Sunday, the first day of the week. So this week, I... I just pray that he will encourage us as we look at his word. As we kind of set the stage, though, for this passage, um, I, I found some interesting things in studying uh, Genesis chapter 1 and, and its contradiction, which is evolution. The, the theory of the world was the religion that was held by Hitler. It's kind of surprising, but Hitler and Stalin were staunch evolutionists. It's what motivated them to uh, lead the genocide of the Jewish people and to perform the eugenics that they did upon society when they ruled those countries. Evolution today is also used as the backing for those who support abortion and infanticide in our country. And the message of evolution is clearly one of no purpose at all. It's, it's purposelessness. There's no reason to live. We're just biological accidents is what evolution says. But the Bible does not say that. It says that every single human life has value and dignity according to God. The Word of God is not just a story. It is factual in everything it says. Everything it says about history is completely historically true. Everything the Bible says about science is in perfect harmony with the truth. It's not wrong. Science is not over here on one side and the Bible on another. God's the one that created science, and so we can trust that it is completely accurate when it speaks. But evolution is just a theory, and a theory means it's speculation. It's not proven fact. Today, Lord willing, I pray that as we look at Genesis chapter 1, we will see the Lord's truth just so clearly, every verse. And I had the privilege several years ago of going to the, uh, the Creation Museum near Cincinnati. It's a great place to go to take your kids, grandkids, and see all the evidence of God creating the earth. There's also over in Kentucky an ark encounter. I've not been able to make it to that yet, but they've, they've built a life-size ark. It's so interesting because you know Noah built that ark in obedience to God to be the mechanism through which people would be saved from the judgment that was coming on the earth. And here today, that Ark attraction in the center of our country draws some couple million people every year, not just Christians, but Jews and Muslims, and they hear a clear gospel presentation every time they come. And when I'm reminded of the Ark, I know I'm kind of deviating from our subject today, but let me read this, because the Ark is so full of symbolism pointing to the gospel of our Lord and Savior. The Ark is full of the symbolism of the gospel. There was one Ark, and it was the only way for deliverance from the judgment of sin. Likewise, Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life and the only one who can wash us as white as snow. The ark was covered inside and out with pitch, a sticky, resinous substance with a reddish-brown tint that sealed the vessel. Likewise, our salvation was bought and covered inside and out with the precious blood that flowed from our Savior's veins. The ark had one door through which everything could enter, and it was sealed by the finger of God sealed shut. So Christ is the one way into the fold which houses God's flock, and our salvation is sealed by the finger of the Almighty. Noah and his family were called into that ark seven days before the flood, and likewise the scriptures speak of the Lord rapturing his church seven 
years before the tribulation is fulfilled. I know I digress into a rabbit trail there, but there's so much to learn from the very beginning of our Bibles. It's so important to teach it to kids because faith is under attack today. God's been removed from the schools, but will we let him be removed from our homes? Will we as Christians not teach our kids, our grandkids, our nephews, our net nieces the word of God? Because what the Bible says here in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 is not optional. It's essential. And I hope we see that today. It's a sad thing when pastors no longer believe in this. I remember in seminary, I talked with others who were also in going to seminary, and they did not believe Genesis was real at all. They said, I'm just a, a, I'm trained to be a pastor. I need to leave those things to the scientists, they said. They said, Adam and Eve are not real people. They're just figurative. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The word of God is true. Our faith is not blind because Hebrews chapter 11, 1 tells us, we have, our faith is now the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of see, things not seen. Assurance, conviction, some translations say evidence there. We can trust in the word of God. So with your Bible open, let us begin in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we will look at verses 1 and 2 first of all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. The Word of God begins with God. He is the one who we should look to. And theologically, we see the Trinity here. It says, in the beginning was God. God created. His Spirit is hovering over the face of the waters. Over in John chapter 1, a parallel passage about creation, talks of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet they did not know Him when He came. And yet I love what verse 14 says. The Word of God became flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Lord Jesus Christ always tells the truth. He always preaches the truth, but He's also full of grace. And what a lesson that is for us as well. May we be full of grace and truth to have that heart that the Lord has of love, but not to back down on what the Word of God says. In verses 3 and 4, we see God begin His work of creation. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the first day. And what we see there very clearly is that there is evening and morning. Now the reason why it says evening and morning, not morning and evening, is because in the Eastern idea of a day, in the Jewish idea, they, they look at a day as evening to morning, not morning to evening. It's still 24 hours. But for example, when they observe the Sabbath, they observe Friday night to Saturday night. It's just the way that they look at a day. But still, Scripture is very clear here. It's speaking of a literal 24-hour time period. God created the world in a day. There was morning, there was evening. He created light and darkness on that first day to divide the two. And the interesting thing is, though, when you look at evolution, evolution changes Back when one of my mentors was in college, so probably about 30 years ago, scientists then said that the earth was several hundred million years old. But today, when I went to college, the last couple of years, now they're saying that it's 12 billion years old. How can it be true if the truth keeps changing? God's word doesn't change because it's true. The truth does not change. But evolution has this so-called magic word, they think. It's this word of time. Just throw in more and more time, and they think we don't need God. But the truth is that if the earth was just millions of years old, according to science, just millions, not billions, then the oceans would be solid blocks of salt that we could walk across because they get saltier every single year. If the earth was truly that old, then the earth would be much colder, not the sweltering heat we've had this week, because the sun would be older and it lessens in its heat the longer that it's around. Erosion and deserts would be much wider spread if the earth was that old. And there would be more weird creatures evolving. And, you know, nothing's really evolving. We, 
We don't see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming to the scene. When mutations occur genetically, it hardly ever is a good thing. It almost always produces defects. Science tells us that. Science tells us the law of biogenesis, which means that something can only reproduce its own kind. A cat can only produce a cat. A cat cannot produce a cat dog. Same way with human beings. Human beings have other human beings. Science says those things. But science is not the enemy here. Science was created by God. The sad thing is that Satan wants to try to twist people's faith and say, you should place your faith in science rather than the Lord. But the truth is, God created science and all true science backs up what the Word of God says because God created it. We don't have to be afraid of the, the science. When I was in school, I remember as a teenager, I was a little bit afraid for a while because it's like I was under attack. All my friends are saying, this is what science says. It drove me deeper into looking what the Word of God says and to find they're not in contradiction. They're in unity. Same way with history. Let's go on in verse 6 and 7 here. And God says, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. So what's it talking about here? There's this big gap between water above and below. Well, it's talking about a, a water canopy. There's waters on the earth here, and then there was water surrounding the earth. Now, we, we know about our atmosphere today, but in the original creation, there was this water canopy that surrounded the earth, and it would keep the earth insulated so that it would be uh, like a greenhouse effect all the time. It would be the perfect environment for Adam and Eve to live in in that perfect world. It would keep the uh, temperature at the equator about 80 degrees and at the poles about 40 degrees. And it would keep the temperature stable at night. There would not be this fluctuation that we have today. Now the Word of God speaks about this over when it talks about the flood as well because it talks about the fountains of heaven being released. And for the first time it speaks of rain when Noah's flood happens. Prior to that, all we see is springs and a mist, a heavy dew that covers the ground prior to the flood. This also, though, would be the prime environment for dinosaurs and other animals, for the lush green vegetation that we power our cars off of today. You know, we, we run our cars on fossil fuels. Well, where do those fossil fuels come from? They came from the original creation that was destroyed in the flood. All of this makes complete sense when we look at the Word of God. There's, there's much more evidence. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in the Word of God. In verse 8, it goes on to tell us about God continuing to create the sky. And God called the expanse heaven, this expanse between the two waters below the waters above. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now when God calls this heaven here, He's clearly speaking about the, the sky Many times in the Psalms it talks about the birds of the heavens are singing and declaring the glory of God. Now when it speaks of that, it's, it makes sense. It's not talking about God in heaven has birds chirping around him. It's talking about the sky. And it talks about the stars of the firmament. In Hebrew, there are three different meanings for the word heaven. And Mormons like to twist this and say that, well, there's this third heaven and so there must be levels in heaven. No, that, that's not what it means. Here's what it means. In Hebrew... First of all, when it talks about the heaven, it talks about the sky, the atmosphere surrounding the earth. And we even talk about it in this way, the birds of the heavens we talk about, clearly referring to the sky. Secondly, we talk about the heavens declaring the glory of God, the firmament showing his handiwork, the stars and the planets, outer space pointing to the one true God. That's the second way that the word in Hebrew talks about heaven. And thirdly, when Paul talks in the New Testament about knowing a man that's been caught up to the third heaven, he's not talking about levels in heaven based on your deeds. He's talking about the third meaning of the word heaven, meaning the literal place where God dwells. And one day the Lord is going to bring heaven to earth when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Eden will be restored in a sense. The new heavens and the new earth. What a, what a thing to look forward to that our Lord will restore creation that is groaning, Scripture says, to be redeemed. It's groaning in anguish of the fall, but one day it will be completely redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 9 and 10, we go on to see God talk about the earth and how when he originally created 
dry land. It was different than it is today. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Now in verse 9, it clearly says the word that the Lord gathered all the water together in one place. If all the water is in one place, then it makes sense that all the land was also together in one place. And many times, evolutionists like to bring up and say, well, there was this one time way back in our history, Pangaea, this one world continent. If you look at the continents we have today, they look like a jigsaw puzzle. You look at, at South America and Africa, it looks like they fit together. The same thing with North America and Europe. It makes sense that when the Lord originally created the Garden of Eden and the earth, he created it as one landmass. Because his original plan was for mankind to spread out, to live in harmony with him, and there would be no division. There was no division of languages and peoples. That all had to come because of the rebellion of the Tower of Babel. And when the flood happened, the word of God tells us that the fountains of the deep burst forth. He had these huge fissures occur throughout the earth's crust that would be spewing up water and pushing the land away. Even to this day, land is moving on tectonic plates and it, it moves slightly all the time. Earthquakes occur. In the original creation, there was none of this fall. There was none of this disorder and chaos that came because of sin. And that really is an important part. When we look at Genesis chapter 1... Our worldview is so important because Jesus speaks about our heart. He speaks about our, our mind and how we think of things affecting us. He says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says that the Pharisees were whitewashed tombs on the outside, but on their heart, they were filthy cups that needed to be cleansed. Our worldview, what we think of in our heart, shapes how we act and how we live. If evolution is true, and I truly believe that evolution has behind it Satan and his demons. It is a spiritual battle. It's not a struggle against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual issue, and here's why. If evolution is true, then death came before sin. Scripture tells us clearly in Romans, the wages of sin is death. The reason why creation is how it is today is because of the fall of Adam and Eve. If the death of humans and animals happened before the sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, then the scripture is not true. That's why Satan fights so hard on this point. That's why he is trying to deceive people here. And if people are just highly evolved forms of animals, then abortion, euthanasia, genocide, the endorsement of our, our government allowing homosexual marriage, which is a great affront to our holy God, if evolution is true, then all those things are okay. If evolution is true, then human life has no higher value than animals. And it's a sad thing, but today people will spend more time in jail in our country for killing a puppy than for killing a human being. It's a sad reality. And if evolution is true, the ultimate point is that then we are masters of our own destinies. It's the survival of the fittest and there is no need for God. John 10.10 10 warned us, the Lord told us, the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of God is important to cling to and hold on to. In verses 11 through 13, it tells us something else very interesting. And God said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Now it talks about seeds here, plants reproducing after their kind. It makes a lot of sense. An apple tree is not going to give us a pear. A tree is going to produce the kind of fruit that that tree is for. In the same way, the DNA that is deep within those seeds continues to boggle scientists to this day. They don't know how to replicate it. They don't know how to make sense of it. God has woven this principle of kinds deeply into us. God forbid the Israelites back in the law from attempting to mix breed cattle and attempting to mix with genetic engineering. And today, people are trying to play God and mess with genetic engineering. 
Typically, hybrid plants, which are genetically altered plants, typically they are less healthy and have fewer nutrients for us than the plants that God originally created, the so-called heirloom plants. Hybrid plants also cannot reproduce seeds that will produce another crop because they've been altered by man. Crossbreeding develops mutations. And mutations do not enhance things, but they make them more sickly and less intelligent. Now, you can breed different types of dogs. That's not what Scripture is talking about here. A dog is a dog is a dog. A wolf is still dog kind. But you cannot mix breed cats and dogs to produce a cat dog. God forbids that. He created our genetic code, our DNA, for a reason. It is created by his design, not ours. In verses 14 through 19, God tells us about why he created the sun, the moon, the stars. There's many purposes why he created it. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. That's outer space. The expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. To rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Throughout the scriptures we see God show us why he gave us the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets. The star of Bethlehem marked our Savior's birth. It was a sign in the heavens declaring that Christ had come. It's how we measure time based on the, uh, the rotation of the earth around the sun. It's how we calculate a year. God said he gave us these planetary bodies so we could track time. The rotation of the earth on its axis is how we calculate a day. It's rotation around the moon, how we calculate a month. In the last days, Revelation is clear that God will show many signs in the heavens to declare who he is. There will be stars that cease to shine and in that day, they as well will be a sign of the coming of the Lord. The sun will diminish in its brightness, and the earth will have more times of darkness during the tribulation. Even the firmament declares the glory of God and shows His beautiful craftsmanship, His handiwork. In verses 20 through 23, God creates life in the oceans and the waters. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with the waters that swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the seas and let the birds on earth multiply. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God created all of that life. The beautiful birds that sing a testament to him, the chirping of the birds when we get up. It reminds me of the Lord. When we look at the oceans and all the, the life there, there is still so much we have to learn. We know less about our oceans than we do about outer space. There is still so much we have to learn about God's creation right here on, on earth. Then in verses 24 through 25, this is where we find where, where dinosaurs were. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit more here in a moment, the Hebrew word and why the word dinosaur isn't in our Bible. Verse 24 through 25, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now here is where we see where dinosaurs were. Now the reason why the word dinosaur is not in our Bible is because that word is not a very old word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. That's why the word is not there. But in Hebrew, this word for creeping things means what we would classify as a reptile. Here is what that word creeping thing means in Hebrew. It's the word remis. You can find it in, in a Strong's Concordance with the, uh, the code 7431. And it means a reptile that glides swiftly. It's pointing to a reptile. Now, why were the dinosaurs so big? And where are they today? 
Well, dinosaurs still exist. Crocodiles, alligators are dinosaurs. They're big lizards. That's all that word dinosaur means. It means a big lizard, a big reptile. Now, why they were so big makes sense. And again, science actually proves what the Bible says. It does not disprove it. Reptiles grow their entire lifespan. It's a very interesting thing. So the Bible tells us that people were living 900 years. It makes sense that animals probably live 900 years too. And if a reptile grows its entire life, that dinosaur would get pretty big. Now the flood would probably wipe a lot of them out. And when Noah took every kind of animal on the ark, he may have taken eggs or small dinosaurs, probably not the big ones. The atmosphere was different after the flood. Plus it was after the flood that then God allows mankind to eat meat prior to that time. And we're going to see this over in a few verses. Prior to the fall, prior to the flood even, God did not allow humans or animals to eat meat. So, it makes sense that when God permitted Noah and his kids to eat meat after the flood, what do you think they're probably going to eat if they know what a dinosaur grows up to? I don't know for certain, but it would make sense. You probably would try to eat that thing that gets really big and scary when God has allowed you to eat meat. But the, the dinosaurs are also right here in Scripture. There's the word behemoth. There's the word leviathan. In the King James Version, there is the word dragon that occurs 22 times in nine different books of the Bible. And sometimes it even speaks of fiery flying serpents like a fire-breathing dragon in Scripture. Now, is that possible? It, it is possible. To this day, there's a couple animals that do breathe fire. There's a beetle that spits fire that's alive today. It's based on chemical reactions that occur within it. It's not beyond God that he may have, may have had fire-breathing dragons. But nonetheless, dinosaurs did exist. They still exist today, crocodiles and alligators. But again, the reason why they didn't probably live as well after the flood is because without that greenhouse effect, without that, uh, that environment that you find when you go to the reptile house in the zoo, warm and moist air, it wasn't like that everywhere around the world after the flood it'd be harder for the dinosaurs to live. The reason why we have fossils, though, even proves the Bible's validity. It proves what the Bible says. The only way you get a fossil is if something undergoes a massive, catastrophic burial. Look at it this way. If you see roadkill on the side of the road, how long is that going to last? Maybe seven days? It's going to rot, it's going to decay, it's going to disappear. If evolution is true and things just slowly evolved into different creatures and then they died off natural causes, we would have no record of there being any fossils. The flood explains why there are so many fossils. A massive flood covering the entire earth would cause the catastrophic burial, pushing the bodies of the, the animals, the plants, the dinosaurs into the rock underneath all that immense pressure of the flood would cause the fossils. Again. The Word of God shows us why we have the fossil record. If we move forward to the next few verses, we also see here in verse uh, chapter 24 and 25, And God makes the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds that creeps on the ground. Now God has given us animals for a reason. In the book of Job chapter 12, God says, But ask the beasts... He says, look at the animals. Ask the beasts and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens and they will tell you. Or ask the bushes of the earth and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath for all mankind. I would dare to say that verse is an encouragement and even a command for us to study science, to study animals and see what we can learn from them because they point to God. Let me share just a couple of them with you. A hummingbird we've probably all seen. This is the smallest bird in nature. It weighs less than a tenth of an ounce. It flies backwards, forwards, sideways. It hovers in midair. Its wings beat 80 strokes a second. And its heart beats a thousand times a minute. Sometimes we think our heart is racing, but theirs beats a thousand times a minute. Their metabolism is so fast that they must feed constantly. And unlike most animals, the hummingbird goes into hibernation every night. I have one question for you. If that bird evolved, how did it live through an evolutionary process if it has to feed constantly? 
it's a point, and it points to the Lord that he created it just as it is for a purpose, not by accident. Look at a woodpecker. A woodpecker has two powerful claws in the front and back of each foot that anchor it to a tree. It has a beak that is harder than other birds, and it has a cushion in the back of its skull, a cushion that protects its brain from being knocked against the bone of its skull so it will not literally knock its brain loose when it's pecking. That points to the creation of God and how he created this animal. Its tongue is four times longer than its beak, and it's barbed and coated with a sticky substance that not only can latch onto the bugs, but even attracts the bugs to it. Not only that, its tail feather, tail feather is stiff and provides stability when it's pecking and climbing. And it has a sense of smell and hearing that are more sensitive. It can hear underneath the bark of a tree the bugs crawling. What an amazing thing God created this animal for. Giraffes. Giraffes are a very tall animal. And uh, when, when you look at them, it just, again, speaks of the wonder of God's creation. They have a unique system of uh, a pulmonary system in order to pump their blood and to breathe. They have an extra long heart, an extra big heart, because they have to be able to pump blood all the way up their neck to their head. Not only that, since the blood has to go that far, their blood pressure is twice what most animals is. And the reason why their knees look like how they look, you, you may think if you've seen a giraffe, they have kind of ugly knees. The reason why is God gave them that thick callous skin on their knees so that the high pressure of the blood would not literally burst through their skin. Because as it travels up the neck, it, the pressure goes down. It's just amazing how God has created this animal. And then you look at the platypus. Now the platypus was discovered in Australia in 1797. And it puzzles every evolutionist I've ever talked with. Because, because here's what a platypus looks like. It has a bill like a duck. It has, a, it has hair that's like a bear. It has webbed feet like an otter. And a tail that's like a beaver. It has a fang on the back of its foot that has poison like a snake. It lays eggs like a turtle, and yet it feeds its youngs like a mammal, and it only grows to 18 inches long when it's fully grown. It has sonar in its beak. Sonar. Electronic sensors that can detect the waves produced by shrimp and earthworms swimming through the water. What an amazing animal God created. There's no way that animal evolved from a rat. It's far too complex to evolve from the rat. We go on in verses 26 and 31 to see God's prime creation. God has said about all of these things, about all the animals, all he's created in the firmament and outer space and all across the world. He said that all those things were good. But then he moves on to what he says is very good. Verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold... I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. Verse 30. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Verses 29 and 30 clearly tell us original creation, mankind and animals were all vegetarians. There was no death in the original creation. That came because of the fall. The Bible is true when it says the wages of sin is death. We can believe what the Bible says. Every verse, every facet ties in with each other. And scripture interprets scripture itself. Mankind was God's last creation, his prime creation, created to steward and rule over all that he had made. We alone, as human beings, are created in the image of God. We are not animals. We are not highly evolved forms of animals. We are created in the image of God. 
That's why every human life has dignity and purpose. God made mankind, men and women. There was no picking what gender people wanted to be. God created marriage between one man, one woman for life. All of this we see just in Genesis chapter 1. And how much of it do we see attacked around us today? To kind of recap, evolution says that animal life is just as valuable or even more valuable than human life. Animals do have value, but human life is far more valuable in God's sight. Human life is about the survival of the fittest, evolution says. And the natural conclusion of that, those who believe in evolution, believe that we should get rid of the weak and the elderly through euthanasia and eugenics. That's what Hitler believed, and he clung to evolution. It was his justification, he said, to commit genocide against six million Jews that he considered to be the weakest link of the human race, not the most evolved, he said. Evolution says that babies are not real humans, so they can be deported. Science does not determine if the Bible is true. The Bible is true because it is God's word. But true science is in sync with the Bible because God created it. We don't have to be afraid of science. And by the way, many of the most famous scientists in history, many of the people that found uh, the greatest cures have been uh, Christian scientists. Sir Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, Blaise Pascal, Michael Faraday, Francis Bacon, many others. When scientific uh, enlightenment and discovery was at its height was when more people believed in Christ. Even though we think we have a lot of technological advancement today and scientific advancement, if you actually look at it, we're not discovering as much as we did back in the 1800s when scientists, for the most part, had faith in God. And today there is a growing number of scientists. Now they're not all, sadly, becoming Christians, but there are a a growing number of scientists that are saying evolution does not make sense. And there's this big, long petition you can look at online. They're saying, this makes no sense, it can't be true. What about all the rock layers in the geologic column you see in school? Those rock layers don't occur anywhere on earth. They're just something a guy made up. Just like that diagram that's made about a baby supposedly going through all these stages of evolution while in the womb. Just something somebody made up. There's no evidence. As a matter of fact, the rock layers, well, they're actually upside down from what the evolutionists say they should be. They say at the bottom should be all the small, little, simple life forms. Go to the Swiss Alps. The Swiss Alps at the very pinnacle of them have all those marine creatures and the simple life forms. It points to the flood, that God's word is true. It would explain why all of those crustaceans and simple quote-unquote fish are on the top of mountains, not buried deep, deep down in rock layers. About radiometric dating, that's just another lie. It's the supposed idea that you can look at a rock and say, That rock is four billion years old because four billion years ago there was twice as much of it. What? That makes no sense. Evolutionists like to use circular reasoning. A lot like kids do. They will look at a fossil and say that fossil is 200 million years old because the creature of that fossil lived 200 million years ago. Okay, that's all assumptions. That's no facts. Kids do the same thing. They look at their parents and say, well, mom said this, but wait, no, dad said that. And they they try to circularly reason things and make themselves look smart, but it's not. In conclusion, if we undermine the Bible, or if we are deceived and don't know what the Bible says about creation, honestly, the gospel is undermined. If the Bible is not true about creation, and it says that Jesus is the one, John chapter 1, who created everything through him and by him, all things were created. If God was not the creator, Jesus is not who he says he was. That's why Satan attacks this. If there was death before the fall, then the entire gospel message that we preach crumbles and falls apart. The world is like it is around us because of sin, because of the fall. It tells us in John chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, All things were made through him, through Christ, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in Colossians, 
He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were made through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. As Brother Garrison uh, comes up as we move toward our, our final song of worship, today, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he your king? He paid the price on the cross. He paid with his own blood so that we can be brought back to him. He created the world as we saw so incredibly. It was marred because of sin, and yet he offers to forgive us and to give us eternal life with him. And he gives us the promise that one day he's going to restore that creation he originally created. Jesus offers us real life, eternal life. Knowing him and enjoying him is all that really matters. So today, is there something you need to lay at his feet? Is there something perhaps you need to repent of, to turn from your sin and turn to God, to believe upon Christ? There's the precious promise of Scripture that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And, to the, and in Romans 10, 17, that God builds our faith by hearing his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. As we close in this last song, I'll, I'll be standing off to the side here if you'd like someone to pray with. But if the Lord's speaking to your heart, don't tune him out. Don't push him aside. Listen to the Lord. Do business with God. Don't, don't resist him, I encourage you. Brother Garrison. For our closing hymn, please stand and turn to page 490. Lord, I'm coming home. Father, we thank you today for Christ. Lord, he is the one who gave it all for us. And I, I just pray this week, Lord, once again, that you would be with us as we go. That you would guide us, Father, on how to share our faith. Father, that you would listen to your voice and not the doubts and the, the trials and temptations that Satan sends against our souls. And Father, I just pray that you would increase our, our confidence and, Lord, our boldness in your word. You've told us over in Isaiah that your word will not return unto you void, but will accomplish everything you sent it forth to do. Father, help us to place our faith in you, not to place our faith in pleasing others or in trying to please the world, because we serve an audience of one. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.